Hi everyone, welcome back to the Be More podcast, where we inspire you to be more of every role within the Salesforce Slack, Yoursoft, Tableau ecosystem. <laughs> and uh, we are back after our short Dreamforce related hiatus. And for today's session, we are talking Be More Chief Happiness Officer. And I'm joined today by Sarah. So, Sarah, without further ado, you introduce yourself to our audience, please. I would love to. Thank you so much. And I mean, that really well-known role in the Salesforce ecosystem, mm. Chief Happiness Officer. I think we should caveat <laughs> that. <laughs> um, my name is Sarah Metcalf. I came into Salesforce and happiness at almost exactly the same time. So it's been like a parallel journey. My background nice. was originally customer experience, um, customer service, as we used to call it, mm. just, you know, in the, in the old days. Um, came across Salesforce, kind of inherited that as an accidental uh, admin. And at the same time, I was running the customer service department for a, a small technology startup company. And I came across the understanding of we needed to deliver great customer service. Uh, we were brand new. And so that was kind of what we needed to do. We had this amazing product. Nobody really knew about it. So what did we have to do? We had to support it with great service. So I got really invested in the idea of creating great customer service. And what I realized was it's not about in an organization. It's not about creating great customer service. You actually have to focus on the the well-being and happiness of your employees. Mm -hmm. And because I was doing Salesforce at the same time, uh, I really got to play around with the science of happiness, leadership, positive psychology, how that impacts teams, organizations as we're building a Salesforce org, as we're expanding, as we're doing that and, and bringing it. Um, and so it, all of those three things for me really combine. So I think that's where it is. I, I ended up being a um, head, kind of finished off being head of CRM. And now I, I work mm -hmm. as a director in technology very much with that space. Um, uh, but my, I guess my chief happiness is I'm a certified chief happiness officer for Happy Coffee Consulting, which is my, uh, the other arm of my life. And, um, I have spent, yeah, I, just about 15 years now reading and studying everything I can on that science of happiness and how it impacts and improves organizations and people's lives and the outcomes that we need to have. So that's a little whirlwind. Yeah, tour around how they put together. Awesome. Well, that that's great. <laughs> I look forward to uh, diving into that and exploring that more. And I think as I was listening to that and watching you, I couldn't help but notice your happy nails. So I feel like oh yeah, let's have a little. These are not only happy nails; they're happy dream forest nails. Yeah, so. <laughs> they're holding up quite well. I yeah. know. Yes, they probably have a couple more days, and then perhaps they need to uh, they yeah, need like, to go next. But yours are very yeah. You're you're very. Very green, I like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I'm, I'm yeah. still haven't let go of Brat Summer just yet. You Good know? for you. Still, Good I'm for you. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, it's, we're just going to ignore the fact we were recording this in October. We're just going to move matter. on. It matter. It's still yeah. the summer. It's the summer <laughs> somewhere. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> back, back on topic. But yeah. looking at your role now and kind of diving into that a little bit more, Mm -hmm. It sounds lovely, right? Chief happiness officer. It sounds, sounds awesome. Yep. I, I would love to have one of those. Um, <laughs> so break it down for me. Like, what does that actually mean day yeah. to day? What sure. type of roles, responsibilities yeah. does that entail? Mm. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, and 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 it's a it's a it's a funny but but very Salesforce esque type of role, right? <laughs> if we go back to the old days of a Salesforce mm -hmm. admin. I would say a chief happiness officer is really very similar. Um, but really, I think the reason we we called it chief happiness officer or it was originally called that was when you look at the science of happiness. OK, and this is all the way back to the original, I guess, kind of teachings of positive psychology. Right. The idea of doing things that make people's lives better. A lot of the focus on. Um, creating a happy workplace and sometimes right now actually using the phrase happiness can can cause people some 
some cognitive dissonance because I went, oh, why should we be happy? Or the world is yeah. having all this chaos and craziness. So, um, so a chief happiness officer is someone who is committed to doing things every day that make people's lives at work better. In the same way, someone working in the Salesforce ecosystem, your job is effectively to hear what's going on in the system. Mm. and find out how you can make it better, right? That's what we're all doing when we're working yeah. on that platform, right? So they, it does, it fits so well together and it always has. Um, but I think the real critical piece is if, you know, is it's something I've always felt inherently. So the way, the reason I, I, I guess I became aware of becoming a chief happiness officer was I worked for a large cancer charity, which does amazing research and amazing science um, and I just happened to work in this really interesting team that wasn't a great place to work. So I knew right. that I was, I had purpose with a massive P on it, right? <laughs> the biggest. Capital P, yeah. But I was just, I didn't love coming to work every day, which didn't, mm. it was so weird. And so I left there and I went to go work for the company, which at the time made cat flaps. So from cancer to cat flaps, right? Something yeah. that has no no P whatsoever mm -hmm. if you look at it like that. But we had such an amazing place to work and we had such a great team and we were so successful as we were building this company. So there was this juxtaposition of how in the world did that happen? And that's what kind of connected mm -hmm. me to, yeah. to that. Um, and I started learning about the science of happiness. I started learning about... Um, what that means okay and so the reason I talk about happiness even though it can cause cognitive dis dissonance is if you ask someone at work we measure engagement a lot okay but Tom if you and I are speaking person to person I would say how happy are you mm. yeah you know what that means yeah exactly happy unhappy that's how humans talk about emotions okay and happiness mm. is in like an umbrella term for positive emotion it doesn't mean happy clappy pretending to be happy it doesn't mean toxic positivity <laughs> it doesn't mean pretending stuff is great okay it means focusing on um making things better it means if stuff is bad how can you make it one percent better right? right obviously with the goal to try to be there it doesn't mean um pretending that you're gonna do uh ever that you're doing everything well and it doesn't mean lying about things when they're bad it, it actually kind of means being able to bring your whole self to work and having kind of that idea of being compassionate so a chief happiness officer is someone who understands the background and does things like checks in with people every day hey how are you doing good yeah. bad and remembers things you know um it's someone who um takes five minutes go have a cup of coffee with someone go connect with someone um does things like gives positive praise and positive feedback. So we're really good at asking um, what we should do better. So basically where yeah. we failed, we're really good at that. Yeah. And humans have a huge <laughs> negativity bias, right? As yeah. humans, it's, it's how we're built, right? It's the fact. What we needed to do. It's what happened. Right. But that is not actually, it doesn't help us be more positive. It doesn't help us go forward. So when you think Tom, I'll, I'll just get it. Maybe I'll turn it to you. Can you tell me about a time you were at work where you were just really happy, like a specific story? Hmm. <laughs> well, you put me on the spot now. And it's I know. Of, Sorry. It's kind of <laughs> tricky to find. Maybe just kind of when I was first starting out in the ecosystem and I was kind of perhaps a little bit overwhelmed with mm -hmm. a deployment because I hadn't really done it before and I was new to using gear set, which I now love. And at that point, I was on my journey to, to going getting there so and it just worked and I was so so happy because it was kind of like this relief this burden was suddenly lifted it, it was gone and and the mm. thing that I needed to get done was done yeah nice. very nice and I'll just 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 nudge you a little bit more mm. were you working with other people at that time no primarily on my on that my was own. you were working on your own okay yeah. perfect so in your in if you were working in a team my guess is you would have had a great team you would have had these things but it's really interesting you've you've told a great story because you haven't told a time when um so you were new so I'm guessing you weren't like insanely well paid would be my guess mm -hmm. you were uh working really hard you had a really hard challenge 
that you needed to overcome. And so you weren't just sitting back, kicking back at work and having the best time doing nothing. You were learning, right? So all of these things, when we think about happiness, people tend to think like, oh, it's just this party, the school, the the class parties or the work parties or the the fun or the drinks or whatever, right? But actually the story you told me was about a time you were working really hard, had a big challenge and you achieved it, okay? And so the things that make up being happy at work are uh, effectively, we kind of buckle, um, put them into the four areas, which is results, which is what you've described really clearly, knowing that what you do matters, being able to measure that you've achieved something. So exactly that story you told, that Mm. you've got the autonomy, the knowledge and the ability to do it. So your results, relationships. So again, if you're working by yourself, it's a, it's a little more challenging because you didn't have people to be there, but I bet you've probably worked in an organization or even if you think about the Salesforce community, what makes that special? Yeah. It's relationships, right? Yeah. And it's people who help you build on those positive things that you've done. And so those results, relationships. Yeah. Then you've heard me talk a bit about purpose. So purpose can be a big P, which is I'm curing cancer. Wonderful. That's easy to do. More and more, we're finding it's the small P, which is what you described. How were you helping somebody? So you did something Mm -hmm. with that job and you made an impact for the people that you were doing that work for, I would imagine, Um, and for yourself, right? And then just a tiny bit of play. So play is where everybody focuses, but play is this tiny bit. Um, And so I think it's it's really important to think about creating that environment um, at work. So a chief happiness officer, what they do is look at those four areas and observe and be aware um and you can do that for yourself so you might have a preference for one of those four areas like everything we're all different Mm. so some people might prefer results some people might prefer relationships and so a chief happiness officer in an organization um, can be anything but someone who all the way up to someone who actually holds that role and that's their only role which is to create a whole culture where you're trying to create an environment where people can do their best work effectively by making changes and helping with those four areas. Um, just down to, to someone who is your, I think we've all worked in a place where maybe that person at the front desk or that receptionist is the, exactly, right? The, yeah. the hub, the person, Yeah. Definitely. right? And, and so anyone can be a chief happiness officer and you can be your own chief happiness officer because some of it is also just about awareness. Uh-huh. So what, what makes me happy? So now you've thought about a day that made you really happy. So on those days when you're not feeling so great, just have a look at those four areas, you know, uh, results, relationships, purpose, and play, and sk- and score yourself. What are you missing? What do you need a bit more of? And it's really interesting. I loved your results focus because I am a real relationship focused person. So, right. yeah, and I almost over index on that. And there's tons of science yeah. about why um relations so so great teams um are Mm -hmm. how work gets done right the highest performing teams are the ones who have the best relationships and um and just to go back to that so what but what I find is because I over index on relationships because it's my preference when I'm not having a great day at work it's because I haven't actually looked at my results I haven't seen that I've made progress I haven't seen the work that I'm doing. And I haven't taken the time to stop and acknowledge that. Um, I haven't done my reflection on, on what I'm doing. So that's, um, that's what a chief happiness officer will do. And sometimes they might create events. um, But often it's more just about helping people understand how can they move the needle? If you've had a really bad day, um, if you're, how do you make it slightly better? How do you check in with people? Mm. Um, Okay. Anyone can be a chief happiness officer. <laughs> yeah, well, I love that message. And I love the, the kind of <laughs> mention of toxic positivity as well. Because yeah, yeah, we can dig into right. that if you want. That is a problem, a big yeah, problem. And, and people think about toxic and they think about other things. Like they don't, they don't kind of put it in that oxymoron, like toxic positivity. Like those, they're so contrasting things. But I can totally like straight away understand what you're talking about. And it's kind of like people just kind of putting a face on, on things. Yeah. Um, yeah. And like the real things being brushed away underneath that metaphorical yes. part, you know? Yeah. So yeah. I think it's important. 
It's super yeah. important. And in fact, I think it's where people turn away from the teachings of, of kind of positive psychology and all the, you know, the, and there's just, there's so much evidence. I could, I could spout loads of numbers, but there's so much yeah. evidence about yeah. it. Right. Um, I won't, I won't do that unless you want to talk numbers. No. <laughs> um, but, um, but the real, I think the critical piece that people think is, and that's the difference between toxic positivity and, and having a positive lens. And one is acknowledging when stuff is bad. So it's about coming, mm. you know, something that I've seen in a, in an office that really focused on these ideas of, of happiness was, um, you've got a little board and you can just check in. How do you, how are you checking in today? You don't have to tell anyone. You just, you know, traffic light or smiley faces, emojis. Yeah. So you can come in. If you're allowed to come into work and instead of going, I'm great, everything's fine. Right. <laughs> or like, yeah. you know, the, the, the British way of greeting people. How are you? Oh, good. You know, yeah. <laughs> that's the only thing you can say. You can't, you're not allowed to. There's nothing else. Any other way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But actually, if you can come to work and and as your whole self and say you're having a really bad day, um, actually, the science proves that if you're allowed to show up and do that, then the likelihood that you're going to move and, and end your day better than you started is like 90 percent. But if you have to pretend that you're fine when really you're not and smile and fake it till you make it, all of that stuff is that's not the sci- what the science backs up. Um, the science is really about being allowed to bring your whole self to work and and having a great team and having a great organization that focuses on, on and I and I say well-being and happiness together because they're both the right things um, and 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 they they tie together. So there's a huge amount of uh, work that's gone into looking at mental health and and having mental health. Um, and the science of happiness maps really perfectly to that. So we actually talk about a mental health diamond. So mental health is like physical health. Uh-huh. Yeah. You can have good physical health or poor physical health. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When we think about mental health, we often only think about poor mental health, right? But actually, if you think about this diamond, um, you have poor mental health, which is below the line and that's absolutely people should get help for that there is absolutely no problem in in admitting that that's what you should do Uh a lot of people are currently and have been since the pandemic existing in the middle that kind of languishing space I don't know if you've ever come across that phrase so the kind of I'm not I'm not in poor mental health I've I've maybe made my way out of poor mental health but I'm just okay really Uh then you have good mental health and the practices that support creating happiness and the science of happiness and well-being are actually the same building blocks that help us move up into positive mental health so just like training at the gym you have to do the work it's a practice you know you don't all of a sudden turn up then you're happy at work and everything's wonderful forever it's not how it works but it's a practice right like mindfulness like going to the gym like any of those things and and if you can build those things that help you experience more positive emotions than negative emotions. And that's all it is. It's just about having slightly more mm. than the negative. It's not about not having negative emotions. So if you build that plan for yourself or you build it with your colleagues so that people notice and are paying attention, then you start to create the steps that help you get to more positive mental health so that when the bad things come you don't fall as far right if you're just sitting and languishing and the bad thing has come well you can easily fall into poor mental health so it helps you build that back up so it is a really kind of critical thing but lying about stuff pretending everything is okay and talking as if this is wonderful everybody Mm. instead of coming to work and saying this is really hard this is really bad, um, then that's that's toxic positivity, which does nothing but creates a complete lack of psychological safety. Nobody talks about anything. And it's you should probably leave that workplace. <laughs> yeah, no, I I can I can relate to that from previous work places. Yeah. Really. Yeah, and we all this is the thing, like we all mm. know what that feels like, right? And yeah, it's the, yeah. the the challenge around identifying it isn't that hard. Because if I asked you where where you had a great work experience or where you had a horrible work experience yeah. you'll know everybody knows what it feels like it's yeah 
it's something we experience in in all of our lives mm. and uh yeah and i guess it's kind of about that transparency being authentic is kind of what i'm taking away yeah. from the conversation and also like at work just today Right. My company's always interested about doing things for the better and improving and learning mm -hmm. from mistakes. So it was decided that in an upcoming team meeting, we're going to be focusing on our failures and sharing our failures and, you know, <laughs> learning from them and being better. And I think that, at least in my mind, is a good thing because mm -hmm. that means the company's willing to listen, right? Yep. They, they, yep. they want people to learn. And improve yeah. and not make the same mistakes as other people. And I've been in companies where we didn't even talk about our failures. So, yeah. you yeah. know, it's just complete other end of the spectrum. What do you think about that? So I love the, the talking about failures. Um, and my challenge is always, um, so you should always talk about them and you should always look at them. Um, but the the interesting thing, and that's almost in the same bucket in, in some ways, it can be in the same bucket as toxic positivity. So when you have full psychological safety, talking about that is perfect. Like, absolutely. Yeah. Everyone learns from it and it's what you do. If what you're doing is only looking at your failures to find out what you should fix, I would say that has some negative connotations because actually, when you're good at something, when you do something really well, you should do more of that, yeah. right? And so if you're going to talk about your failures, absolutely should do. You should also create a space to talk about your wins. Yeah, what did yeah, you yeah. do well? How did someone do those really amazing things so that everybody also learns how to do more positive things, right? Um, and and the so we have done that. Um, and there's a great kind of story about, um, my, you know, if Michael Jordan had a um, performance review um, I don't know if you remember, he had this this period in his career where he was like the most famous, recognized basketball player in the world. And mm -hmm. then he went and played baseball for a little while. Yeah. It was okay. <laughs> and then he came back to, to basketball, right? <laughs> if you had done a performance review or what you're saying to talk about what he needed to do better, you would have said he should have doubled down and focused on baseball. Mm, yeah. But actually, what was his strength? He should have focused on what he was good at because he was really, really really good at basketball yeah so it's just a, it's about talking about how you can get better mm -hmm. and bringing yourself to acknowledge that what do we need to do how do we fix it that's hugely transformational and you should absolutely do that but you should also pay attention to what is your organization doing really well how mm -hmm. do we do more yeah. of that and some of that might yeah. be by doing yeah. less of this stuff and that's also okay so but i would just say yeah it's yeah. always about like having it's holistic right it's the good and the bad and because humans have that negativity bias it's so easy for us to be like and this is bad and this is bad and this is bad i mean it's easy like um our brains are built for that and we actually have to practice to to think about the good things so i would just say yeah. use it but don't make sure it's balanced <laughs> yeah yeah well <laughs> <laughs> the good thing is, as, as a company, and I'm going to bring it back to technology now. Yeah, I do. We use Slack and we have a, a boom channel. So anything nice. good happens, somebody Amazing. goes above and beyond, whatever. Amazing. And as a company, we were maybe 150, 200 people. We have nice. three or four booms a day. That's so awesome. We so have you so, can feel that. so many yeah. booms. Yeah. Um, yeah. So... We're, we're flipping it on its head and trying to yeah. go the other way. Yeah, and, and that's cool. like, and that is also mm -hmm. important, right? If you are over indexing on the positive, you need to then make sure you have the space for people to fail because people then might feel like, oh gosh, everyone's perfect all the time and I'm not perfect or I haven't got a boom or whatever. So yeah. balance, <laughs> like, absolutely, this is, you know, <laughs> this is the right way to go about it. But it, I think it's, it's just, ha it's also like having a language to share it. Um, you know, and when you're using that technology, like technology is such an enabler for this kind of thing, especially now that we're hybrid working and teams aren't yeah. together, right? It's so much easier when, when you see each other, but technology is that thing that can help you connect and, and, and still do all those, you know, wonderful connection pieces and, and celebrating what you do well. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think the power of that and the power of doing that across oceans yeah. is super, Huge. super important. Magic, right? Super like, realized. Yeah. Like in today's world, 
Like I yeah. work with colleagues in Africa, I work with colleagues in uh, America. So yeah. like there's yeah. so much like so many miles basically between us or so many kilometers yeah. from where you're yeah. listening to this too, I guess really. But yeah, super powerful. So anyway, picking up the pace a little bit. Yes, um, sorry, I get all excited. Like, <laughs> right, we both like to chat, right? And I'm, I'm right? <laughs> learning and listening. So like, it's great for me. <laughs> but thinking okay. about this now, if you were to summarize like yeah. skills or attributes it took mm. to be a chief happiness officer, yeah, what kind of two, three key bullets would you kind of share with our audience? What do you think is important? Oh, that's amazing. Honestly, I think if you if you want to be a chief happiness officer, um, so it's interesting. Initially, I would say like having a positive outlook is good, um, right? So having being able to. However, uh, some of the best chief happiness officers I know are actually a little bit more cynical than perhaps <laughs> myself, um, yeah. because they're really drilling into that, um, and so they do get a little bit more. Um, focus on yeah but why or what Um, so I would say actually a passion for improving things in the workplace Mm -hmm. and what I mean by that is processes so as a as a salesforce professional um, the reason this is really critical is when you have more of the positive mindset you see more options So you're more creative and you're better at problem solving. So that's one of the positive benefits. Um, So someone who wants to make a difference, someone who feels uh, like that, I think you might have to like people. Not going (laughs) to lie. Uh, (laughs) I guess. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I I think that was quite. Like, I think that might be an important thing. I, for me, actually, I I think being able to articulate because it's something I I was challenged with, and it it took me a long time. So being able to articulate the difference between kind of toxic positivity and and really what the science says in terms of utilizing these kind of positive things to do that is really useful. So so having some sort of understanding of the the benefits. Um, and the reasons to do it. And I always like to invite the introverts into the room because I, <laughs> as much as much as most people won't believe me, I am actually an introvert. <laughs> so am I. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And again, we do. Like yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we do our jobs and we have to be here and we're out there and, you know, you can do that all day. But sometimes our little introverted brains can learn a little bit see a little bit differently and um Mm. and 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 sometimes you you look at things because sometimes a chief happiness officer can accidentally just become a party planner um (laughs) yeah and just focus on those kind of the happy clappy stuff which is where you get that and it's not always there that the impact is made so I would say if you maybe think you're not happy enough or you're not out there enough then that's probably a really good uh, indicator that you would make a great chief. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, awesome. Okay, so thinking about your own journey now to to chief happiness officer, if you were to do that same journey again, what would you do differently? Is there anything you would change, switch up? I try not to think because I always feel like you never know what you know. Like I, I always, as my career has progressed, there are places. I would never be able to be now had I not done all of the crazy, weird, and winding <laughs> paths that I had. Yeah. So part of me is like, but maybe, maybe I can reframe it. Um, I wish that I had doubled down on talking about happiness as an organizational tool earlier. Honestly, mm. I used to feel embarrassed about it. I used to be like, oh, "What's a bit cringy? Not everyone likes <laughs> it." Or, or, um, and not everyone is going to like it, hands no. down. And not everyone's going to like everything, and that's totally no. fine. Yeah. Um, but I, yeah, I wish that I had had been super brave and talked about it earlier, because what you can do and how you can support people and organizations, which is really what drives me, um, this understanding is 
in, it's the absolute criticality of creating high performing teams, high performing organizations, making things different, being able to problem solve, um, mm. working, working in Salesforce, I would say, using that lens of happiness, how to make people's lives at work better is a, it's a game changer. Yeah. So yeah, just, yeah. and maybe just kind of turning it back on you a little bit there, but you had to go <laughs> on the journey to realize that yeah. you could have, should have, would have done that sooner. Right. Yeah, no, yeah. you're right. I think I had to go and, and dig into it and probably face the discomfort mm. of, yeah people who challenged it because because I came to it in a in a weird way like it, it was something that I had always known but I didn't have the language for it I didn't understand right. it so I had to then learn how to talk about it yeah um, and then once I started talking about it then yeah you're right meeting that kind of the challenges meant I had to go and dig around to go huh yeah why is that or why do people feel like that and so then be aware of of how it lands and then also I probably have in the past been toxically positive as I've gone mm. through that learning journey so I would do mm. less of that um yeah. and and more vulnerable and more honest about how I was showing up yeah yeah totally yeah. okay so now you've got an opportunity to kind of clarify demyth something about being chief happiness officer is there anything that comes to mind and people think oh chief happiness officer is obviously this thing yeah right. yeah Pick one of those and okay what, what comes to mind and what would you like to clarify I think that it's a job that has to have a title you know that you have to have a certain background or so when people see that as a job title my ever since I put it up there so when did I when did I become a certified chief happiness officer <laughs> six years ago the biggest messaging or comments or anything I get linked in and anywhere is, um, oh, that's an amazing job title. I wish I could do <laughs> one. So I think the answer being you have to do something special or be something special or have a PhD in happiness to be chief happiness <laughs> officer, uh, which I don't have. Um, you don't at all. And also probably the other side to that is that a chief happiness officer is happy all the time. So those would be my two, two myths to debunk. Um, well, you're only human. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and maybe I can tell a teeny story about the week that I really realized the power of creating a happy team. And it was, we had a team that was amazing. And at the time there was some challenges in the workplace like bigger organizational challenges. And, and I was, you know, kind of thinking like, oh, do I really want to be here? Or is this what I really need? And on the Monday, one of our colleagues came in and shared with us that um, one a family member had been diagnosed with terminal cancer um, and she wanted to come to work and she wanted to share that with us and she wanted to be with us because she felt safe enough to do that. Um, and at the end of that same week, one of our colleagues came in and shared with us that he and his wife were able to have a baby after trying for more than 10 years. And so having a team in an environment where people could come together and show up as themselves on what would effectively be their worst day and maybe yeah. their best days, um, still to this day, quite a lot of years later, that is possibly one of the best weeks, best worst most crazy weeks of my life but it's about creating an environment where people can bring their whole selves to work and that's what yeah. that's for me what is actually behind being a chief happiness officer is is that human the really human centric side of, of creating workplaces that matter to people yeah being vulnerable kind of being open being honest yeah. and also yeah. I feel like I just have to say it saying f to cancer uh, yeah, I feel definitely. Like part of it as well, like a hundred percent. A hundred percent of that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so we are bringing the session for today to a close. But before we do go, what's a way for people to connect with you? And is there any particular content um, that you'd like to share for our audience to kind of review and, and think about this a little bit more? Yeah, I would love to. So you can find me on LinkedIn, Sarah Mecca. 
um, you can go to my website, which is Happy Coffee Consulting. Um, it's called Happy Coffee because the easiest thing you can do to make something a little bit happier is to grab a, a beverage of your choice. Doesn't yeah. have to be coffee, <laughs> and sit down for five minutes and have a conversation with someone mm. that matters. Um, and uh, if you like, I can I can share a link uh, with your listeners if if yeah. you want, Tom, and they can download a little kind of check in leading with happiness thing just little yeah. tiny things you can do um and i would just recommend um yeah just pausing and and being aware um happiness we've got two types of happiness what we think and what we feel yeah and we are really good at doing the stuff that we think which is <laughs> do i get paid well am i doing this stuff all that kind of yeah. stuff but what really impacts how we are at work every day is how we feel so mm-hmm. just doing that little bit of being aware noticing and uh and checking in with with themselves that's something anyone can do it doesn't take any any longer than a couple of seconds um so just check in with yourself see how it went and what can you do to make your life just that little bit more positive today yeah okay fab well I think that's a great way to to close things out. So thanks again for your time today. And hopefully we will inspire some more people to at least be more happy. Uh, more, <laughs> more chief happiness officers. So thanks again. The world definitely needs more chief happiness officers yeah. at the moment. More happiness, yeah. Yeah, yeah for sure. Thank cool. you so much for having me and thanks for listening. Thanks. Thanks.